Let's do this. Welcome back to The Adoptimist Way. I am your host, Paige, and in each episode, we will be taking a deep dive into the topics that are so, so important for adoptive parents today. This podcast is part inspiration, part instruction, and hopefully really, really useful for you. There is a lot to know about trying to make online connections, but don't be intimidated. We're here to help. Red flags and scams are some of the biggest stressors for potential adoptive families. It can be scary to not know if the person on the other side of the screen is real and if their intentions are good or not. Scams are by no means a unique problem to the adoption world, but it is important to know what to look out for and how to protect yourself, both financially and emotionally. Talking with me today is adoption attorney Faith Getz Russo, an expert in noticing, avoiding, and dealing with scams in the adoption process. Faith, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Paige. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Would you like to start by sharing with our listeners a little bit about your background and your practice? Sure. So I am a sole practitioner, meaning I work on my own. I have my own law office. I'm in the suburbs of New York, about a half an hour from the city in Nassau County. My office is devoted almost 100% to adoption issues. I represent prospective adoptive parents. I also represent expected parents who are placing their children for adoption in the private adoptions. I represent adoptive parents in agency adoptions as well. So after the children are placed with them, I also represent foster parents in their adoptions. So you really represent everyone. (laughs) I do. I try. Yes, I do. I do step parent adoptions and adult adoptions as well. Wow. That's amazing. How often in your work do you come across scams and issues with your clients? It happens. Um, It is the dark side of adoptions and for all the good that comes out of adoptions that children whose parents can't raise them choose to place their children. It is the dark side. It's sad that there Mm -hmm. are people out there that are taking advantage of the hopeful adoptive parents. Um, My feeling is, and I'm jumping ahead to some of your questions, but the hopeful parents who keep They're professionals in the loop from day one. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen. Not that they're not contacted, but we're able to detect it earlier Mm -hmm. and protect the hopeful parents. Right. You can't necessarily stop a scam or, um, you know, a possible red flag message from coming in, but you can help protect those families from having to deal with it. Yes, that's exactly it. So I don't want to say we're contacted weekly, but I think that the clients that stay in touch with us, that um, advise us of every contact, tell us, take really good notes as to what the communications were between Mm -hmm. these people. We could see a pattern. So sometimes they'll email me and they'll say, "Um, I was contacted by whatever her name is. And she says she's due then. And she says she lives here, but she's hungry. She needs food. She says she's homeless. She says her father beats her. She says this, she says this, she says this. All of a sudden, I've seen so much of it over the years, as my assistant has, that I will go back through other emails and say, okay, somebody else contact one of my other clients. It could have been a year ago. In a Gabby situation, it could have been five, six years ago. But Mm -hmm. if they keep us in the loop, we're able to detect it earlier. Mm -hmm. Right. The more information you have on other scams that have happened and potential red flags, the more you can know and look out for future ones. Yes. A hundred percent. Awesome. So could you define for our audience just in general, what is a scam? So my understanding is a scam is someone, an adoption scammer, is someone that holds themselves out as being pregnant with the intent to place their child for adoption without planning to do so. Mm. What does that look like? It could be a person who tells multiple families they'll be placing the baby with them all. Well, since there may be one baby, one baby can't be cut into all those different um, places. Right. So they're scamming someone. They may mm-hmm. ultimately believe they're going to place, 
but they can't possibly place with every family that they have promised this baby to. So that would be a scammer. A person who takes money, who has no intent to place their baby, um, mm -hmm. that's a scammer. I mean, it all goes down to the intent, which is very subjective, obviously. Yes. Um, but it's. I think what's really important for people to know is that it's not a scam for a birth parent to change their mind. Mm -hmm. So the number one question potential clients give me when they first start the process is, how often will I be scammed? What can you do to protect me? Thinking I have that ability, like my that superpower, <laughs> which I don't necessarily have. And, um, you know, will they change their mind and take their baby back? Those are the questions that people ask me. Those are the, like the first thing that comes out of their mouth. And I'm like, okay, we're going, we're bringing the car before the horse. So like, I kind of circle back and explain to them a scammer who's someone who does not intend to place. All right. Mm -hmm. They think most of the clients come in, think that someone asked them for money and makes them a scammer. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the first red flag. I know now I'm jumping ahead a little as to red flags, but that is definitely not the first red flag for me. Um, what I remind my clients is, but for these pregnant women having resources, they would not be looking on the internet to place their baby. Right. But that does right. not make them a scammer. It may make them someone very desperate and it mm -hmm. may make them somebody who's hungry or may make them someone who has no place to live, or they right. are a victim of abuse, or, or has no health care. No health care. Doesn't know how to get health care. That's right. the issue. Because if they knew how to get it, there's ways of getting it by going into mm -hmm. the clinic, and they'll help you apply for Medicaid. But they don't even know how to do that. And Paige, what basically what you just said is that they don't have the support system Absolutely. To get the resources they need. So they don't have loving families. They don't have friends that they can rely on. Most of them don't have um, the birth fathers. Mm -hmm. They're not trustworthy. Many of them are not trustworthy. They come and they go. So that does not make them a scammer. It makes them someone who honestly needs money. And right. they don't <laughs> know that there's restrictions. Mm -hmm. And that to me goes into the first um, sign for me that there's a scam, so that it potentially is a scam. Not that they're asking, but when I explain to them, we are permitted to give certain living expenses per law. So you mu we must follow the laws of New York because that's where my clients are adopting into. Mm -hmm. If this is going to be finalized in the state of New York, where my clients are. Under New York law, we're only allowed to give living expenses for three months, two months before the baby's born, one month after. Mm. All expenses must be related to the birth and pregnancy. Okay. Other states have different laws. And I know you're, this is going to be heard by other states as well. <laughs> so other states may say, okay, we can give living expenses throughout the entire pregnancy, then some, but it gets mm. capped at a number say so maybe 10,000. I've seen that happen. Other states will say, we could, living expenses could be provided for throughout the entire pregnancy. But if it's anything over, say $1,500, a judge must, must sign off on it. Oh, so there's more okay. restrictions. Where I my um, radar goes up is when we, I explain this to an expected parent and she doesn't care. She mm. still says, I want the money. I want the money. Or I say no money could go from the adoptive parent, hopeful adoptive parent, to the expected parent. All money must go through a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And they don't hear that either. Then they reach out to my client and tell them they're hungry. They reach out to my client and say, it's freezing and I have no shoes. I, you know, and my client, they're pushing my client's buttons because they're so vulnerable and they're so right. anxious to make these people happy that they they will send them money. They'll mm -hmm. even without telling their lawyers. That's how they put themselves in a situation where they may be scammed. That's scary. That's scary. The thought of someone trying to manipulate 
such a vulnerable situation. You know, when you are looking to adopt, um, not only are you in such a vulnerable spot yourself, but you have so much empathy for the expectant mothers that you speak to and connect with. And to think that a woman is in a very dire situation, it, it's hard to turn off that emotion in yourself and say, well, this must be a scam. It it really does play on your emotion. And I can completely understand how so many people would give that money thinking that, like, I, I just need to help this woman, you know? That's, that's terrible. Just to, you know, follow up on that, the number one thing I would suggest to hopeful adoptive parents to protect themselves is never to give money directly, never. Mm -hmm. All requests for money must go through your agency or your attorney. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I bang my clients over the head with that. It could compromise your adoption. It could be considered a criminal act to give someone money for their baby. Right. And everything must go through our office. And it's mm -hmm. funny because... It amazes me when clients will like call me and I'll have one, like the husband or the wife get on the phone. I'm like, all right. It's usually the husband's calling and goes, my wife wants to talk to you. I'm like, why? What happened? All right. They were hungry and I sent them a pizza and I know I'm not supposed to do that. I'm like, no, you are not supposed to do that. Like, and I laughed to myself. I'm like, wow, they really listened to me, you know, but, I, <laughs> but I almost, no, it does it's sometimes, <laughs> but I, I honestly, I repeat it so many times at every mm -hmm. stage of the process. You are never to give them any money directly ever. Everything comes through either our office or their office. This way we can prevent right. that scam, right. you know, and I find that one of the red flags that I see is the girls who don't want to talk to the lawyer. They mm -hmm. don't want to talk to me. They need in New York state the birth parent must have their own counsel. Mm. That is not the case in every state, but in New York state. So that's really what I know here. They must have their own attorney. Now, the hopeful adoptive parents pay for their attorney, but the um, retainer agreement says that they represent the birth parent. They do, they're do. they getting paid by the adoptive parent, but they represent the interest of the birth parent. Right. And when you have a, an expected parent who refuses to speak to a lawyer, to me, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. saying to them on my first intake, I am not representing you. I represent the hopeful, you know, the adoptive parents. And you should have your own counsel because I want to make sure you're protected. I want you, I don't want you to think that anyone's taking advantage of you. Mm -hmm. The girls who will not who are attorney phobic does not mean they're a scam. I don't want everyone to say, oh, they won't talk to my lawyer, they're a scammer. Some of them have had run-ins with attorneys and lawyers and police right. and court. So we're all bad people and they're scared of us all. They think we're all out to get them. But my, in my experience, the girls who really want to find a good home for their baby, they'll mm -hmm. talk to whoever we ask them to talk to. Yeah. Because they want it yeah. to work. And so just to clarify again, it's, the uh, adoptive families, the state that they live in, are the laws that you should look That's up for the, laws that we the follow, spending yes. and things like that. Um, okay. So it is possible to finalize your adoption where the baby is born mm -hmm. in some states. Mm. So you need to be working with a competent adoption attorney or an agency. So agency adoptions and in private independent are very different. When we're dealing private independent, mm -hmm. we, in New York, we go by the laws in New York, if that's where we're going to finalize. Okay. If we choose to follow the laws in the state where the baby is born, then you follow the laws there. Now, if you're dealing with an agency adoption, because my understanding is that now many families who have employed agencies to make the matches, they're showing up on Adoptimist and doing mm -hmm. Google AdWords themselves. So they're saying, so the waiting time is really long, so we're going to use Adoptimist or use Google AdWords also to make things go faster, right so absolutely it, yes. it's i'm going to say adoption professionals in general 
And if you connect with someone, you always bring that connection back to whoever you're working mm-hmm. with. Yep. When do you say that a client should bring that connection? Like the first message that you receive, or do you wait a few days to see how it goes? In my office, and I can only speak for me, the first contact. Mm -hmm. And in our office, we provide our clients with the tools to communicate with us on a regular basis. So when you have that first contact in the subject line, I Mm -hmm. ask that they put the girl's name. They have the whole name. Sometimes they have no name, but the girl's name the state they're from, and the estimated due date if they know it. And Mm -hmm. in every contact regarding that one expected parent, I want the same subject line. And I tell my clients, um, I need to know anything they've told you. You You're not interviewing them. Um, They're interviewing you to see if you're a good family. The fact that they've contacted you, so let's go to the adoptimist situation, right? They have thousands of... they potentially hundreds of families out there, right? They have chosen (laughs) you. They have seen hundreds and hundreds of families and they have said, I think this may be a good family for Mm -hmm. my child to be placed in. So they essentially swiped on you first, like a dating app, right? You should feel pretty good about that. Like, wow, they like something about me. I don't believe in the whole kitchen sink and the profiles. I think of your profiles as a teaser, Mm-hmm. And when you do the diary portion of Adoptimist, you keep adding color. You keep adding a mm-hmm. little more about you, a little more about you, right? And they get to know you a little better. Then they get up the um, nerve to contact you. All you're to say is, I am so happy that you contacted me. I feel blessed that you would consider us as a family for your child. What else do you want to know about us? And she- it is possible she says nothing. I'm good. That to me is a flag, really. Mm-hmm. She's no. It is that's a flag. It's not the telltale that's a scam, but does she really care where her kid's going? Or she just doesn't want her kid in foster care, assuming she's pregnant. Really? Maybe right. that's it. She's saying, I'll pick any family. I just don't want to deal with social services. That might be the case. So we have to hedge. But to me, that's kind of interesting. She took the time of finding adoptimist. She took the time of clicking. She took the time of calling or texting or DMing, whatever she does. But then she doesn't care about anything about you. Hmm, Really? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So that to me is a potential scam right there. Not scam, but it's something for me to consider, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I tell my clients to write every detail that they get from their communications, including little things like, was there a dog barking? Was there a baby crying? I know that sounds really silly. Were there sirens? Were there other Mm. people talking in the background? Anything Mm. that you get, you put in your communications because it's my job to screen, not my clients. And our office can't screen if we have nothing to screen. So if I, if they wrote in their email, that they heard a dog barking. I can guarantee myself or my assistant, when we speak to this expected parent to do an intake, I will talk about my dog. I do have a dog, but I will talk about the, a dog. Even if she, I don't hear the dog, I was like, mm-hmm. you know what? Can you give me a second? My dog's at the door. I was working from home. I made that up. But I want her to then say, I have a dog too. If right. she doesn't say anything about dogs, as silly as that sounds. That's a red flag. To me, it's like, ooh, why is she lying about a dog? Yeah. She's lying about a dog. What else is she lying about? I will say, oh, do you have a dog? No, I hate dogs. Does your does anyone in your house have a dog? Um, does your neighbors have a dog that bark all the time? If she's like, what are you talking about? Well, if you're lying about the dog, hmm, it's not the only flag, but it's something for me to be like, What else is she not being honest about? Mm -hmm. So when things don't match. (laughs) Yes, the inconsistencies. And how else am I going to screen the inconsistencies if I don't have all the information? Mm -hmm. And we're on our clients constantly that in real time, we want all the information, especially, like I said earlier, if 
the same woman is contacting multiple clients of mine, which is does not make her a scammer. I like when pregnant women, expected parents contact multiple people initially because it shows me they care about where their kid's going. Mm -hmm. They're not knee jerking. Oh, that one's right. Fine. They're actually doing their due diligence on their own to say who would the best family be in an agency the under the, you know the expectation is that the agency's caseworkers are facilitating the matches but mm. in private we don't have that agency to do it for us so the more you give us the more we could screen and the more we could compare and if you actually give me that subject line with the information i could do a search in our database and say has anyone contacted us with similar facts and I will say to my clients, I just want to let you know, she sounds great, but she has contacted two other clients of mine. So mm -hmm. just don't get too emotionally invested. Keep talking, but just be careful because she is speaking to other people. So for these people who do these scams, a lot of times people consider them emotional scams, right? In the yeah. adoption world, um, because, you know adoptive families are in a very vulnerable intimate place mm -hmm. um in a very empathetic mindset and so it's very easy to manipulate their emotions but you know these scammers still have to get their information from somewhere they still have to convince these families that they're pregnant and that they're willing to give their baby up for adoption so where do they get all of their information and photos and you know um ultrasounds and things like that from that they give to these families so i'm hearing two parts of your question sure so, okay <laughs> i'm gonna go with the first then i'll jump to the second the first part is where do they get the information to potentially scam mm -hmm. right they get them from the hopeful adoptive parents putting themselves out there that's why we encourage our clients profiles to be more teasers than the whole thing because the mm. more you put out there, the more they could pick up on it. So if there's pictures of you, I'm not telling you not to do it because I do tell my clients to do the diary portion and talk about what you did. I, t I We advise our clients to do Instagram, make your profile as, as a teaser, but mm -hmm. then Instagram throws the color. If you say you like cooking, Show me cooking. If you if you're a runner, I want to mm -hmm. see you running. People, my gut is people don't read. People are visual, right. especially that demographic. They're very visual, and that's the world we live in. People see things, mm -hmm. so I encourage people to paint a picture with pictures of who you are. Backside is they now have something to to use against you. Mm -hmm. They can now say. Um, when they're on the phone with you, they saw that you like gardening. They could say, oh, I'm not, what do you like to do? And she could say, oh, I love to garden. Well, why? Okay, really? She probably, she could live in the middle of the city and has never seen a blade of grass. But meanwhile, she knows you like gardening. That's what the emotional scammer does. The emotional mm -hmm. scammer has no intent to place either. She's pregnant herself. And she never planned to place her baby or she was never pregnant as in the Gabby thing or, mm -hmm. and therefore she, it's a scam, emotional scam, right? So where does she get the information to, to push your buttons, to make you feel like she's real? She's stalking you and mm -hmm. she's following you and you're giving her the information that you want to hear. Oh my gosh, we like the same music. Oh my gosh, we like the same color. We like the same food. We like the same, we have the same interest. So on one hand, you're putting yourself out there so someone could see how amazing you are and what a great parent you might be. On the other hand, you're feeding information to a potentially scary person, right? Yeah. Okay, that's the first answer. The second is where is she getting her ultrasounds that might not be accurate? Where is mm -hmm. she getting her pictures of her preg her and her pregnant belly. That's catfishing. I mean, that's taking on someone's persona. Mm -hmm. And that's because people who are newly pregnant tend to post their own ultrasounds. People who are newly pregnant post baby pictures. And some of them, the ones that can afford the professional pregnancy pictures 
they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. They're expensive. They're beautiful. They're well done. They're professionally done. And who, how great is it to send that to someone who wants to be a parent desperately, right? Right. And have them go, oh my God, they're carrying my baby. Because it's from the minute they hear from the birth parent, they all think that's it, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. That's where I, and in addition, and I'd be naive to say that there are websites that you could do fake ultrasounds and you could PDF. I mean, anyone could, with Adobe, I'm telling people how to do it, but you could just change the name and date of birth. I mean, yeah. so that could be done very easily. So how do you tell the difference between a woman who seems like she is saying all the right things and it's probably a scam versus a woman who genuinely just has a lot in common with this hopeful adoptive family. The only way I could do it is if my clients help me, if mm. they're providing me information on a regular basis in real time. Um, and this way I have something to pick up on an inconsistency. Um, I want to talk about adoption scam boards for a sec, because I know you guys, Adoptimist has their own, but then there's yes. a number of Facebook walls out there that are quote unquote adoption scam boards. Mm -hmm. um, I encourage my clients to be part of the scam boards and to look up the girl's names. Just because a girl's name is on the scam board does not make her a scammer. Many times, uneducated, hopeful adoptive parents are asked to give money and they think that's a scam. So they put it up there. Very often, somebody who has every intent to place chooses somebody else. Right. That is not a scam. They are allowed to change their mind. But Absolutely. And upset and hurt, hopeful adoptive parents will write the entire story on a scam board. Mm -hmm. Okay. I advise my clients never to post on the scam board. That's that's my that's that's from our office. Look at them. Look at them. If you're using if you're connecting through Adoptimist, I tell them to reach out to you guys directly. Mm -hmm. If we have any concerns, so you will tell us. Somebody in Adoptimist will tell my clients that we have a pulse on this person and we cut off their access. Right. I don't want my clients posting, although um, I think that the right baby ultimately or child finds their way to the right family. I and mean, that might be a lot of rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> but even though I believe that, I think that many, there's so many adoptive parents out, hopeful adoptive parents out there without as many children. And there is competition and people mm -hmm. do undermine each other. And I don't trust that you posted, did anyone speak to Katie from Missouri who was pregnant so-and-so? All they want to know is she's talking to somebody else. But what happens is another family speaking to Katie from Missouri, and I just made that up, and they then tell Katie, you know, if you're talking to a family from New Jersey, you know that they're writing your information all over scam boards and writing horrible stuff about you. I've heard that happening. So mm -hmm. I advise my clients don't post. Um, we sometimes post on scam boards on their behalf and say, mm -hmm. Has, is anyone speaking to so-and-so? And it's coming from my office and people DM me, people message me. I'll say, please email me direct. And I'll hear from agencies who say, we've spoken to this person mm. and we're currently giving them money. And I will say, well, I want you to know that they're looking for another family. Interesting. So you yeah. will post to those boards yeah. um, on behalf of your clients so that they Not don't have but, to worry about yes. doing that themselves. Mm -hmm. If there, if the board gives you the anonymous feature, I'm okay with it. But mm -hmm. not if they have to identify themselves. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, yeah I've seen it happen before where expected parents will stop talking to my client and then write this horrible thing to them. You were telling everyone I'm a scam. And I have to tell you, I've had multiple situations in their office where there have been incredible adoption stories and that person happened to have been on the scam board and we were aware mm -hmm. of it. And we tell our clients, well, we saw their name on the scam board 
So let's just say cautiously optimistic. Right. Not stop. Don't call them out on it. It's not your place to call them out. If anything, let us be the bad guys. You mm -hmm. just keep doing you, but just be cautiously optimistic. And what tends to happen is once our clients have been scammed once, they, they think everyone's a scammer. And yeah. it comes through. Um, they hear it in their voice, in the tone of their texts. Right. And they the expected parents realize that these people don't trust them. If right. you're not going to trust them, what kind of parent are you going to be? So you're sabotaging yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, once you have one bad experience, it can be really hard to put that off to the side and say, yeah. okay, but every new experience is not going to be guaranteed that same bad experience. A hundred percent. And it's really hard. And we used to, talk about the Gabby situation on a regular basis. Like, what is it? Every time my clients go live, she contacts them. It's like she gets them out of the gate and then she like makes them so paranoid for every mm -hmm. other situation. Yeah. So you, you've mentioned Gabby now a few times. Yeah. Could you explain to any of our listeners who have not heard of her before, um, who is Gabby and what is the type of scam that she runs? So... Gabby Watson is her name. She was recently charged by the FBI in Memphis for cyber stalking, interstate transmission of threats to injure or kidnap. Um, she would contact hopeful families saying that she wanted to adopt. She is one of the people that would talk about being abused by someone. She's talking while she's in a closet. We heard that a lot. Um, and maybe her mom passed away. I believe I believe she tells a lot of people that. Her story, interestingly enough, is very consistent. She talks about the same things a lot. But one of the things, when you read her text messages or her emails, she sounds like Abby. She doesn't change it up. At least she hadn't over the years. So it's a very distinctive way of both speaking and writing. She calls my clients a hundred times. She doesn't let them breathe. If they mm -hmm. don't get right back to them, there's another text. Don't you want my baby? Don't you want to be a parent? Do not want to be a parent. That is a Gabby thing. It doesn't stop. Um, I could tell you she has ruined more Christmas Eves than I'd like to admit to. Holidays, Easter's, whenever there's a family event, she mm -hmm. strikes. Right. And it's constant. Um, she does call attorneys. I've spoken to her multiple times. I've sometimes spoken to her more than once in one day about different clients, which is so strange to me. And when I'll call her out on it and say, do you call me recently? Didn't I speak to you a couple of hours ago about so-and-so? I don't know what you're talking about. She tends to try to put the adoptive parents against their own lawyer. You don't need the lawyer. Why are you talking to them? I'd give you my baby if you got a different lawyer. Um, that's a typical Gabby thing. Um, she started changing her names. She had a number of aliases. But her story always was similar. And if you read through the email, mm -hmm. sometimes my clients are contacted, and I'll send it to my assistant, their, my client's email, and I'll be like, they just forwarded me this DM, what do you think? And she'll pull up another one. And it's just very clear. She sounds the same. So is Gabby doing this to get money out of these families or is no, it just she never for asks the for money. emotional warfare and the bombardment? Emotional. Yeah, it's she's she obviously has significant emotional issues, mm -hmm. mental health issues, and she is happy causing emotional pain to other people. Um, you know, but she's not alone. There are other people. There's, you know, I don't know if it's because they've read about Gabby, they've heard about Gabby, and they also have issues. Like, I could do this too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had, I have a couple of scam situations in the back of my mind that don't go away. Like, they keep me up at night. Like, do we miss something? Do we miss something? And ironically, the two that were the most disturbing to me, my, one, my client got on, got to the airport, checked their bags. Wow. And the biological parent had an attorney on the other side and they met with their attorney in person. And we had HIPAA form signed, meaning we were able to get medical information about her throughout the entire pregnancy. She told my client where, what hospital she was giving birth to. 
the boyfriend was keeping in touch with my clients in real time. She's at the hospital. She's in labor. I hope you get there in time. She wants you in the room. And then I called the hospital and there was no one there by that name. So then I called the lawyer and I said, I believe she's in labor. I know there's a HIPAA form with my name so I could check on the baby's welfare, but can you maybe check? And the lawyer called me back and be like, are you sure this is the hospital they went to? Like, this is where they told my clients. My clients would verify. We're taking a plane. Can you text us the address? This is it. They were they were never there. We never heard from them again. Wow. And even their own so, lawyer couldn't get a hold of them again? Yeah. I, and I've had, I haven't had, I'm going to say out of all of our adoptions, I've had two of those out of all of the years I've been doing this. It's a lot of adoptions. I've had two with a, almost a similar years apart where they said we're in labor, we're about to give birth, blah, blah, blah. And then they weren't even, they weren't at that hospital. We never heard from them again. Now wow. in both those situations, Paige, I'm going to bring to your attention. They did not ask for money. Hmm. And yeah. And they said they did not need living expenses. And it makes me think that those emotional scammers might have emotional issues, <laughs> mental health issues, but they're not stupid and they do their research and they know if money changes hands, they're in more trouble mm. than an emotional scam that no one could prove they had no intent to place. Right. Where, or it's very difficult to prove. I'm not saying they can't prove, but it's going to be very difficult. Um, but once money changes hands, especially over state lines, they could be in a lot more trouble so they purposely do not take money. Do you think that's what made it so difficult to um, try to prosecute Gabby before? And that's why yeah. she's been able to do this for so many years? Yeah, I think so. I don't recall. I mean, I haven't had an interaction with her, at least knowingly, in a very long time. But I don't think she asked any of my clients for money. Interesting. I, I don't believe she did. I can't yeah. imagine the, the place that she must be in to have to spend so much time and energy doing this to other people, you know? So, yeah. I mean, one of the things I say to my clients in response to what you just said is you can't rationalize with irrational people, mm -hmm. right? So when we try to understand how someone murders someone, how someone hurts someone intentionally, I personally couldn't understand because that's not some, within my DNA to do that right. to someone who's like, believe so. But it might, I can't put myself in that person's shoes because that's not who I am mm -hmm. to cause intentional harm, either emotional, physical, right, right, to anybody else. I don't think we could truly understand what goes on in her mind yeah. that she would want to put people through that much pain. Um, as to the catfishing, there have been times over the years where we take the picture these days. I mean, things have changed in the Internet over the last couple of years where it is not difficult to take the screenshot of a pregnant belly, pregnant girl, put it in Google search backwards, and you come up with the real person in five seconds. Mm -hmm. And then we will contact that person if we can through Facebook or Instagram, if that's where the picture was taken from and tell them what's happening. Mm. And I've had, I will message them and say, there's somebody using your picture saying that she's you and that she's placing the baby. And that's one of the other things that we do to detect red flags is that when we get a picture, we do do a Google search backwards. Mm. And then we look up that person's social, if they have social. Now, if I look at someone's social and they're talking about a baby shower, hmm, that's not really consistent with placing, right? right. So I'm like, hmm, are they really going to place if they're in a baby shower? Really? If they're writing things, how they can't wait to have the baby and that Ryan, who's the birth father, allegedly is the love of their life. And they can't wait to raise this kid with Ryan. Like that doesn't sound like they're placing a baby for adoption, mm -hmm. does it? So those are the things we look at. Um, I don't expect my clients to do it. It's just part of our screening process. Interesting. So you wouldn't necessarily recommend um, your clients do it themselves, but it is something that you do to just to be an extra safety precaution. We do it. 
Um, I don't tell my clients not to do it, but I don't encourage them to do it either. Mm -hmm. It's just part of what our screening process looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are some other just typical red flags that you look out for? I know we've said a lot that, you know, any one possible red flag doesn't necessarily mean that someone's a scammer, but I think that when a lot of little red flags pile up, that's usually a a big sign. So what are some of those other red flags that you look out for? Well, one is most definitely the inconsistencies and how many there are. Um, refusing to speak to either the case, the agency or the lawyer, trying to turn you against your attorney or your agency, saying if you want to be a parent, you won't talk to them or you'll get a new lawyer. They're annoying. Mm-hmm. Um, putting words in your in the attorney or the agency's mouth that are not true. Um, refusal to sign a HIPAA form. Mm. Um, we need to get proof of pregnancy directly from a doctor or a clinic. The refusal to sign it, being dishonest as to whether they've gone to the doctor or not. Are there any legitimate reasons that a woman would do those two things? Why they wouldn't want an attorney involved? Yeah, and why they wouldn't sign a HIPAA form? Is there really, like... I, to so, me, those sound like really big red flags. Like, I can't yeah. really think so, why someone wouldn't. Well, I, okay. As to not speaking to a lawyer or an agency, we discussed this earlier. Mm-hmm, it's because right. they're scared of Absolutely. lawyers. We're very scared, right? Okay. So that's the first thing. That I could see someone being afraid of us. Okay. I tell my clients when you're speaking to the expected parent initially, if they're asking you for something, the, I always get this question from my clients. When do we ask them to speak to you? Mm. When do we tell them they need to have their own lawyer? So the answer I give my clients is the more you know, the less apt they're going to talk to us. And we don't represent them. We just get a basic intake, do some screening, and then we give them a list of lawyers and say, we're not recommending one over another, but you will need your own counsel. Mm-hmm. All right. So the first thing is if they won't speak to me or they won't speak to the agency, they're either they've been they've been speaking to multiple families. They've been speaking to multiple agencies. They're taking money from multiple people Mm -hmm. and they're afraid that someone will find out about them. So to me, you really want to find a good home for your baby and you really like the people you're speaking to and want to get to know them better. Why won't you speak to their attorney to find out what the next step is? Mm -hmm. So I tell my clients, I educate my clients as to the process. When I'm on the support group walls and I see the questions that people ask, I'm like, they are not my clients. My clients know what the process looks (laughs) like. My clients know what and what not to say when they speak to expected parents. We go over this right from the beginning. I don't want my clients walking around like the blind folds on. Mm -hmm. This is their life. They have to know. But... Don't share it with an expected parent because if you're telling them, well, this is what's going to happen. We could give you money for two months before, one month after. And then when you're in labor, you're going to call us and we're going to get on the plane and you're going to have a look. No, mm -mm. why do they need to talk to me? You just told them what they thought they had to hear. Especially if they're asking for money. Your answer is always when they ask for money, we would give you anything we're allowed to, but you have to ask the lawyers. So if you keep with that statement, we will help you any way we can. But you have to ask the lawyers. You say it enough time, they're going to come to me because they want the money. <laughs> right. right. So but if you say to them, sure, what do you need? Mm-hmm. Why are they going to come to me? Right. They're getting what they need from them. Right. So that's the first thing. Get them to speak to your lawyer or the, your agency, if your agency is handling your adoption. Um, why wouldn't they sign a HIPAA form? Because they're doing drugs. They're not taking care of themselves. They haven't gone to the doctor. Mm. They want, they're hiding something about the health of the baby, or they simply don't know Mm -hmm. because they haven't gone. That to me is a big, um, we talk about that in my client. That's an issue with my client. You don't ask the woman when the last doctor appointment was, you don't ask her, how big the baby is, the sex of the baby. You don't ask her anything because A, she's either going to tell you what you want to hear and make it up Mm -hmm. 
Or she's going to think that that's all you care about. Your job when she calls you, I tell my clients, is just to get to know them. The more you get to know, the more we have ways of screening Mm -hmm. and the more apt she is to place with you because she realizes you care about her right make it a comfortable place for her not just for the baby yeah and if you start asking her about her doctor appointments the sex of the baby etc all she hears is you're going to judge me if i haven't gone to the doctor Mm -hmm. and you and i talked about this a little before we started many of these girls don't have health care and they don't know how to get health care mm-hmm. so if she hasn't gone to the doctor there might be a really good reason not drugs it might be because she didn't know she could go and not pay right. their clinics and that's why she hasn't gone or if she goes i've had girls who place who are lovely i mean they're honest girls they if they leave work to go to the doctor they're going to lose their job mm-hmm. So they're not going to risk lose. These are responsible young ladies. They're not going to risk losing their job. So in their mind, it's better for me to keep a job, but they haven't had medical right. attention right. and they don't want to be judged. So let your, let the lawyers screen you, mm-hmm. screen them. Don't ask them those hard questions. Um, and I guess the money thing could be a red flag asking for money but we talked about that not necessarily mean yeah she's a scammer she might in fact be just desperate right right so you really do um encourage your clients to contact you often and really keep you in the loop you're very hands-on with your clients and the adoptions yeah Yeah. that's amazing we find that the clients that speak to us on a regular basis Mm -hmm. get babies they have they become parents a lot quicker than the ones that we don't hear from. Interesting. That's really interesting to hear. Yeah. So what would you say is your best piece of advice for families that are looking to adopt on avoiding scams, but still staying hopeful and open while they're making new connections? A lot of the question. It's hard. It's really hard not to get you know, burned, not Mm. to feel like everyone's scamming you Mm -hmm. in this. Because when you take a step back and you think about it, you're putting yourself out there in hopes that someone wants to give you their baby to raise. I mean, that's what this adoption is, right? Especially private placement, Mm -hmm. right? And it's really hard not to get critical and not to be scared of every person who contacts you, especially since we all know these scammers do exist. My best advice is connect to a professional that you trust right from the beginning and keep them in the loop. Let them screen for you. If your adoption professional says that's not our job, you just come back when she's going to have the baby. It's not the right professional for you. It's not. And I've worked with so many adoption professionals over the years and I, you know, and I hope that I do it different. I'm more hands-on. We're more accessible. All of our clients have, we have a cell phone number that's 24 hours, assuming they don't abuse it. <laughs> if I advise my clients, if you're texting with an expected parent and they're asking you, well, after the adoption, will I be able to spend Christmas with the baby? Well, that's something that we talk about right in the beginning. Are you comfortable in an open adoption? Are you comfortable having them over for the holidays? Mm-hmm. That's really an open situation. That's another conversation. But what is your answer going to be? If you make this gasping noise and say, oh, my God, no, <laughs> you might never speak to that person again, right? right? They're giving you their kid and you're saying, oh, my God, no. Well, you might really in your mind say, oh my gosh, no, but that's not how you answer. Mm -hmm. You say, wow, I wasn't expecting that. Can I give it some thought? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of tact that's required. Yeah. And you keep the door kind of opened and you say, let me give it some thought. Mm -hmm. You never always make your professional. I don't know if anyone would agree with me, but in our office, I'm the bad guy. You're the yes person. (laughs) If there's ever anything, you know, can you pay for my car payments? In New York, we can't pay for your car payments. There are some states where you can. Mm -hmm. I've done adoptions with some states that that is an acceptable expense. 
I've done adoptions in some states that if the girl is behind in her rent, you could pay for her arrears, the rent she hasn't paid. That is not acceptable in New York. Mm -hmm. She asks you, she may be asking these questions because her friend just placed the baby for adoption in a state where it was, a, mm -hmm. you know, allowed. It doesn't mean that she's a scammer. It means she doesn't know. Mm -hmm. But she might care so much about you that those things don't matter. Right. You know? So how do you decide when you're seeing red flags? Um, how do you decide if one of your clients should continue with a connection and, you know, see where it goes? Or when do you decide that this is probably a scam, we should cut off this connection? Where do you draw that line? If I have reason to know she's a known scammer, mm -hmm. I've connected to other adoption professionals that have said, we know she's scamming. I will tell my clients enough on my end. That's one. Two, if I find that the situation is causing my clients so much emotional distress, mm. it's not worth it because they need to stay emotionally healthy. And she may in fact place, but it's not the right situation for you. And I try to, we try to explain tell our clients that they should not come off as desperate, that they'll take any baby regardless. I mean, we're not an agency or agencies. You check the boxes. Will you take a baby who has um, drug exposure? Will you take a baby with a physical deformity? Will you take a baby with race A, B, or C? We're not an agency. I'm not making match. I don't need to see your grid, what you're comfortable with. This is your life. I'm not raising the baby. You are. Right. So you could come into my office and say, I only want to be the same race as me. I'm not judging you. I'm not raising the kid. You are. Right. But then you go and you meet, you start talking to an expected parent and all of a sudden she's biracial. The birth father's biracial. All of a sudden, how about the ones, the birth mothers who tell you that the birth, they have no idea who the father is. Mm -hmm. Then the baby is born and the baby's a race that you weren't expecting. Well, you have every right as a hopeful parent, adoptive parent, a hopeful adoptive parent to walk. Mm -hmm. Say it's not the right situation for me. No one's binding you. And no one's going to say, I'm going to work less hard for you because you passed on the situation. Right. Uh, you have to raise this child. So if you could stay emotionally healthy through the process, and we have no real evidence it's a scammer, I tell my clients, you just keep yourself out there, mm -hmm. keep it in its place, and you just keep going. Um, you know, we laugh a lot. We're like, it's not over till it's over, till that lady sings, right? Absolutely. You keep going. I can't tell you how many times my clients will connect to a birth parent and be like, this is it, this is it, this is it. And they want to take down the adoptimist, take down their Google AdWords. No more advertising. No more. No, we're done. This is perfect. We, we have this love fest. And then it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't know until the baby's in your arms if this is going to be the right situation for you. So I suggest if you could keep it in its place, keep speaking to them because crazier things have happened. Right. And but keep yourself open to other situations. Awesome. That is some great final advice for our listeners. Thank you so much for talking with me today, Faith. You're welcome. And there is a reason that both adoption agencies and attorneys work with adoptimists. Advertising works. The more people that see your profile, the greater the chances are that you find a connection. Adoptimist custom ad campaigns run on all major search engines, including Meta Facebook, Instagram, Google Ads, and even TikTok. I am Paige Woodall, reminding you that when it comes to adoption outreach, there's the wrong way and the adoptimist way. You can learn more about adoption outreach and advertising anytime at www.adoptimist.com.